So on to tonight's event, Helping Patients Access Mental Health Care in New York. It features a presentation by Samantha, uh, Stephanie Campbell. She's our director of the New York State Behavioral Ombudsman Project. Our event is being recorded. Um, and please feel free to put questions in the chat um, and unmute and ask uh, questions towards the end. So I'd like to welcome Stephanie without further ado. Today, after receiving her master's from Columbia University, she received an MS from the University of Albany and an MSW from New York University. She then joined Friends of Recovery New York or New York in 2015 and has worked at the state and national level um, on public policy issues affecting individuals and families impacted by addiction. And as a person in sustained recovery, Stephanie now serves as director of the New York State Ombudsman Office and oversees a statewide program to help New Yorkers access treatment, harm reduction, and peer support services along the full continuum of healthcare. She's an adjunct professor at NYU Silver School of Social Work and a member of the Recovery Policy Collaborative in partnership with the Addiction and Public Policy Initiative at O'Neill Institute. So I really wanna um, welcome Stephanie and I turn it over to you. We're really happy that you were able to join us tonight. Thank you, Dr. Kranz, and uh, really, really wonderful to, uh, to be here um, and uh, honored to be among uh, uh, this uh, esteemed group of, uh, of providers and, um, you know, healthcare um, leaders. Um, so I wanted to just talk a little bit about, um, you know, the, the office that, uh, that I oversee um, at OASIS and OMH um, uh, through the Community Health Access to Addiction and um, um, uh, project. So um, I, I, I know that most of you know um, there has been a, um, you know, a surge in both overdose um, deaths uh, as well as suicide completions here, um, not only in New York State, um, but, uh, but the country. We've had um, certainly the most um, overdose deaths recorded since uh, these, you know, uh, numbers have been collected. Um, and, um, you know, looking at the data from the CDC, we're seeing, um, you know, an almost 30% increase from this time last year. We know that um, what's often referred to as the twindemic, which is COVID-19, um, you know, in combination with, um, you know, the, the rise in overdose and, and suicide completions uh, that, you know, COVID has really impacted, um, you know, uh, uh, mental health in particular, and, um, and certainly, um, you know, part of the issues uh, that have also contributed uh, to, uh, to, to this rise has been um, access to care and uh, insurance uh, benefits, um, you know, the, the, the sort of intersectionality between, you know, insurance uh, and, um, you know, access to, to treatment uh, continue to be um, a prime issue. Next slide. So a few years back, um, you know, the governor and the legislature um, established the first in the nation uh, office of the ombudsman um, uh, program. Um, and, and it was really, um, you know, a joint effort between, you know, advocates, it was a partnership between advocates um, and uh, as well as government and other decision makers uh, that, um, you know, recognize that, that, you know, uh, access to immediate care um, is, is, is essential. And that's, and despite many of the um, changes made uh, in particular to the New York State uh, insurance um, law, um, coverage for um, behavioral health care um, was not, um, you know, always um, uh, available. And, and certainly, um, <clears throat> you know, we know that uh, there have been significant issues, uh, parity issues, that um, certainly MAPIA has tried to address. Uh, you know, there's, uh, there's a real, um, you know, commitment uh, on behalf of, um, you know, New York State to address uh, parity issues, but it still continues. There is a disparity between, um, you know, uh, often what, what, what is uh, paid for, uh, for medical and surgical uh, issues and behavioral uh, health issues. And again, you know, as, um, you know, many of you know, there's, you know, there's a desire to truly integrate um, behavioral health and, and mental health care. Uh, and, and so it was, it was recognized that, um, that there needed to be a program uh, to really help 
both you know, clients uh, needing these services and providers uh, resolve um, insurance issues. In addition to uh, the insurance barriers, um, you know, our team helps uh, New Yorkers um, you know, access um, social determinant of health um, uh, uh, issues such as you know, uh, transportation needs, housing, uh, and peer services. Um, next slide, please. The way that, uh, that the Ombudsman Office is structured, um, we have a um, Monday through Friday, uh, 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. helpline that's run through uh, Community Service Society. Um, we also provide a learning community. Um, you know, we, we do all of the contracting, budgets, uh, and quality assurance. And then we work with uh, the state on Sentinel issues uh, that are identified through data that's collected um, through, uh, through CHAMP. We also have uh, three specialists, um, which include Legal Action Center. They often provide legal uh, support um, uh, for justice-involved issues, as well as um, you know, substance use um, you know, discrimination, um, and, uh, and also um, Medicare Rights Center. As many of you know, um, you know Medicare uh, brings with it, uh, you know, a, a whole other set of um, insurance access issues for individuals, um, uh, usually our older population, individuals who, um, you know, have, um, you know, uh, certain disabilities. Um, and um, so though that, that specialist organization has been essential in helping uh, clients with those and providers with those issues. And then there's the New York State Council for Community Behavioral Health Care. Uh, which really has um, extensive expertise uh, in uh, both mental health and substance use. Uh, then we have um, CBOs, uh, community-based organizations that do outreach uh, within their communities. There are currently five uh, CBOs um, in, uh, in various um, regions around the state, including Adirondack Health Institute, which is in the Northern part of the state, uh, Community Health Action on Staten Island, um, Family and Children's Association out on uh, Long Island, uh, Family and Children's Counseling Services in Central New York and Save the Michaels of the World out in the Western part of uh, the state. And they do a lot of outreach again in their communities uh, for individuals who are calling for these services um, and, uh, and direct um, contact with uh, individuals and families uh, in their communities uh, who need access to care and insurance. Next slide, please. So we um, are really um, focused on, you know, uh, collecting data on these cases um, that, that are aggregated through um, Salesforce and then um, uh, my office in particular. Um, we do a lot of assessment in, um, you know, identifying both demographics, um, providers uh, and clients uh, uh, issues. Uh, and then, you know, we aggregate that data um, uh, in the form of reports that we generate uh, to, uh, you know, to disseminate to our, our state partners. Um, and, and again, um, you know, we, we also provide, um, you know, individualized assistance, um, you know, as well as appeals that are filed by our attorneys uh, on behalf of clients uh, and, um, uh, and, and also um, you know, deal with um, adverse determinations um, that, that uh, our clients receive. And again, the data that we collect uh, informs our state partners on both uh, parity issues and access to care issues. Next slide, please. So just some of the, you know, um, the outreach that we do uh, in terms of getting uh, the information out about um, our program. Uh, again, I, I mentioned we do, um, you know, complex cases and appeals, uh, which as you, as many of you know, require uh, voluminous amounts of, uh, uh, of paperwork sometimes, which include, um, you know, medical um, uh, charts and, and other information. Uh, but we also do community education and provide training and technical assistance. Next slide, please. 
And then our, our um, team helps, um, you know, with individualized casework um, for those access to care issues. Um, again, as I mentioned, uh, the, you know, the, the legal um, uh, cases and appeals. Um, and then also, you know, there's a lot of, as you know, insurance plans are very complex. So oftentimes when individuals call and they're not exactly sure what their insurance coverage is or uh, what benefits they have, uh, our team can help, uh, you know, with, with that information as well. Next slide, please. And just a, a little um, overview uh, map. I'm a very visual person, uh, but uh, this sort of looks at um, you know the network both of our uh, CBOs and um, you know and our specialists. Next slide, please. Uh, since we launched in uh, 2018, um, we've uh, handled um, over 5,300 cases um, and have reached about a quarter of a million people through uh, outreach and education. And, um, and th that includes uh, both cases that come in through the helpline uh, as well as uh, my office here. Next slide, please. I always like to talk about success stories um, and it also serves as a way to humanize uh, the individuals that uh, you know that we care for and, and provide these services to. Uh, in one case, um, Lily, um, and these names have all been uh, changed to protect identity. Um, and, and by the way, we've seen a number of, of issues with commercial insurance plans, which uh, tend to not always be governed uh, by uh, under New York State uh, law. So those um, you know plans can can sometimes have um, you know, uh, uh, complexities around insurance benefits. But anyway, Lily uh, is, a, is a New York resident and um, uh, insured through her father's um, plan through his, he's a state employee. employee. Uh, but she was a college student in, in uh, Tennessee. And uh, before she uh, started college, she was hospitalized uh, for a mental health treatment. And then she uh, returned home to New York uh, for further treatment. Um, her New York providers would not clear her to return to college until she had mental health care uh, that was set up in Tennessee. And so her mother had arranged for her to see a mental health provider in Tennessee, but, um, but Lily's uh, insurance plan denied coverage because uh, the providers uh, were out of network. Again, this is a commercial plan uh, with very different um, in-network and out-of-network uh, depending on where you're at. And the, the plan had no in-network providers in Tennessee. Um, her parents had tried appealing the denials but were unsuccessful. Uh, however, with um, the CHAMP uh, attorneys, uh, Lily's parents uh, were able to file additional appeal which resulted in the plan overturning its denials and covering her care in Tennessee. So she was also uh, reimbursed for $1,000 for which if you're a college student, that's an astronomical amount of money. So she was uh, reimbursed that amount of money. And then we were able to help her parents obtain a single case agreement uh, with the plan so that um, her uh, providers in Tennessee uh, agreed to treat uh, the providers in network uh, so that she was able to engage in treatment. Next slide, please. Ted um, uh, contacted uh, us, um, actually it was a provider that uh, contacted us uh, for um, uh, her patient, Ted, who had uh, both um, a mental health and substance use uh, condition. As I'm sure many of you know, the, um, you know, the overlap between mental health and substance use uh, can provide some, you know, those, those co-occurring issues can provide um, uh, some, some difficulties in, in being able to access care. And so Ted, uh, who is also living with schizophrenia, um, had uh, at the same uh, time was in need of inpatient um, alcohol use uh, treatment. And, um, and his local hospital um, had uh, confirmed that they, while they accepted his insurance, um, that uh, to, to be able to access uh, inpatient uh, alcohol use 
uh, treatment, he would need to present at the hospital's emergency department for stabilization, uh, after which he would then be transferred. Uh, so when, when this individual went to his hospital's emergency department, uh, they uh, informed him they would not be able to detox him there. Uh, and they would not be able to transfer him to their detox facility because they had no available beds. So unfortunately, Ted was discharged home. And as you know, um, oftentimes, um, you know, these issues uh, spiral if not treated um, quickly. So, um, so Champ had reached out to, um, uh, to uh, you know, both myself, and then I was able to uh, have a conversation uh, with uh, directly with uh, an addiction treatment center. Uh, and we were also able to bring in a Medicare Rights Center as there were complex uh, insurance issues around his Medicare. So I'm happy to say that this individual uh, is, uh, was successfully treated uh, and is on the road to recovery. Next slide, please. Uh, Felicia had called us because her Medicaid managed care plan, Fidelis, uh, had been uh, denying a formulary ex uh, exemption uh, from her subsol. And I'm going to just pause here for a moment. Um, I, I've gotten a number of calls uh, from physicians uh, across the state who've been concerned uh, around some of the restrictions around, um, you know, life-saving medications. Uh, in this particular case, um, Felicia had switched her plan from uh, United Healthcare to Fidelis um, so that she could, uh, you know, see her primary care physician. And while the provider um, uh, filed an expedited appeal for a formulary exception uh, to the denial, um, they upheld, uh, Fidelis had upheld its denial. So we were able to help this um, uh, individual change her plan back to United Healthcare and connect her uh, with um, a peer at a CODI project. And for those of you who don't aren't familiar with the CODI projects, those are the centers of treatment innovation, uh, which provide uh, outpatient services outside of the four walls. They were able to bridge her medication until that plan switch became effective and her uh, subsol was uh, once again covered by insurance. Next slide. And then, as many of you know, um, you know, children have been especially vulnerable during um, during COVID. And uh, this particular uh, mom called us because her son had aged out of a Child Health Plus and was going to need ongoing health care, uh, including medications and medical services. So, um, you know, we were able to um, uh, get that uh, individual, even though. Um, you know, the, the son and uh, mom were not um, U.S. citizens. Uh, they were permanently residing under color of law uh, and, then, uh, and, and therefore were eligible uh, for insurance uh, through the exchange. So we were able to connect uh, mom with, um, with CSS's Consumer Navigator Network, uh, which helped uh, mom and uh, her family, in fact, enroll uh, on the essential uh, plan uh, for and that enabled her son to continue to receive his mental health and other medical services. Next slide, please. So just, um, you know, briefly, uh, we provide um, technical assistance, uh, again, with, with complex cases, uh, both to clients and to providers, um, and, uh, and also, uh, you know, do extensive training both in community uh, to different organizations, uh, including topics like uh, commercial insurance, uh, Medicare, Medicaid, uh, parity, the appeals process, um, IMD exclusions, confidentiality, case handling, uh, and working with high-risk uh, individuals. Next slide, please. And again, we, uh, we also conduct outreach. Um, uh, which includes, you know, conferences and um, some of the conversations such as the one I'm having with you today. Uh, but we also work with, um, you know, in community um, organizations um, uh, to, to also help uh, support them. As, you, as many of you know, um, some, uh, you know, some of the in community organizations don't always 
you know, again, uh, understand the complexities of insurance and the appeals process and, uh, and you know, navigating uh, many of the complexities around access to care. Next slide, please. Um, I think I mentioned to you at the start of this that we, um, we do have um, a live answer helpline that's open at 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. Um, and, um, you know, and we work on a number of issues, um, again, that include uh, out-of-network care, um, finding in-network providers, appealing denials, and, um, and, and, and so forth and so on. Next slide, please. Um, I'm going to skip to the next slide uh, because I already talked a little bit about that. Um, I think it's important to know that those community linkages are crucial. Uh, oftentimes, you know, um, many of the, you know, the, the referral sources will sort of, you know, hand individuals a piece of paper and say, you know, here are three referrals. Um, but we do is we not only, um, you know, uh, provide uh, linkages, um, both through the referral process, but we work with um, the license programs, ACT teams, um, the CCBHCs, uh, as well as the CODIs for folks in community who need um, things like, you know, bridge medications. Um, and uh, we also connect um, families to family support navigators and peer engagement specialists. As many of you know, there's been a real uh, push to um, uh, involve uh, peer support services in both uh, substance use and mental health. And so being able to link those individuals uh, to, um, to those individuals with lived experience uh, has been very helpful uh, while helping them uh, navigate uh, treatment. Uh, we also um, you know, work with folks to get them connected to harm reduction services uh, and recovery services in addition to treatment. Next slide, please. And as I mentioned, just um, you know, some of the expertise um, you know that uh, is involved at Champ. We do have uh, three health counselors that uh, include uh, attorneys and social workers um, that uh, answer that helpline, uh, do client intakes, um, and then handle all aspects of client cases, including referrals and requests for access to uh, mental health and addiction services and supports, uh, do screenings for insurance um, eligibility, uh, research plans, um, explain uh, rights to both clients and providers, uh, and advocate with insurers and others uh, in that appeals process. Next slide, please. So again, there's the, the helpline uh, number. Um, I, I wanted to include um, you know, my contact information. Uh, feel free to reach out uh, anytime if I can be of assistance or helpful and um, facilitating uh, linkages for you in the work that you do, um, happy to do so. And really want to thank you uh, for um, the work that you do. You know, it's the life-saving, um, you know, work that, that uh, in this unprecedented time that our, our, our medical professionals are doing um, that, that quite literally are, um, you know, are, are keeping people alive and, uh, and, and building in that hope. Um, so thank you so much for the opportunity to, uh, to talk with you. Thank you very much, Ms. Campbell. This is Dr. Heisig, the district president from Syracuse, and I'm going to open up the question and answer section. And I'm going to begin with a few questions of my own just to break the ice. So does New York State, does your organization perceive a shortage of medical health therapists or a disconnect between uh, what we need and what we have geographically? In Syracuse, for example, a child or adolescent who needs psychiatric care may actually have to travel to a different city to get it, especially inpatient care. And I'm the medical director of a PACE organization. So I'm the medical director, not only of the primary care practice, but of the insurance company. And I've struggled finding people to contract with me to provide mental health services. And some of our established contractors are saying they're full. Their panels are full and they can't take any more of my patients. So for us, it's not just an insurance issue, really isn't for us an insurance issue. It's a literal issue of the resource being available in our region. 
What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, that is a, a really uh, great question and, um, and, and comment. You know, um, when we look at access to care and as it you know, interfaces with, um, with parity, um, part of the issue is you know, network adequacy and um, that is oftentimes tied into um, reimbursement rates, right? That these issues are, um, you know, uh, are intertwined. And so part of what's happening here in New York State with um, the recognition and what's happened, I think, with COVID um, is that this disparity um, has only been exacerbated um, as the pandemic has you know, restricted access to, um, you know, with social distancing, uh, close certain doors, um, and, and has really, um, you know, uh, strained an already strained system. So, you know, there are a number of, uh, of initiatives. I, I, you know, the, the, the good news is, is that um, the federal government under the Biden-Harris administration has really prioritized um, you know, um, behavioral health. Um, they they recognize that um, you know um, the intersectionality between you know um, COVID and um, you know the impact on mental health uh, and and the and the overdose um, epidemic has you know has has strained uh, the system. So they're infusing uh, substantial dollars. Uh, here in, um, you know, across the country, but in New York State, um, you know, we're, we're getting a number of, um, you know, initiatives uh, off the ground, also shoring up current, um, you know, programs, um, you know, creating um, these new crisis stabilization centers, which will regionally, there's a hundred million dollars that just in that initiative alone, uh, that will be creating, um, you know, 24 seven access uh, to, um, you know, to, uh, you know, for, for mental health and substance use, um, a crisis stabilization for individuals that will then provide linkages, uh, uh, you know, to, uh, to in community services. Um, and, you know, and I think that, um, you know, also, you know, it's, it's also been interesting how telehealth has changed the landscape, right? You know, in some ways, um, who would have ever thought you know, that uh, telehealth would be so widely available and reimbursable um, for, um, you know, for both, you know, not only behavioral health services, but also, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, medical, surgical um, uh, consults and such. So, you know, so on the flip side of that, you know, it's been challenging, um, you know, in, in part for individuals who don't yet have, you um, you know, the capacity to, uh, to provide those services through telehealth. Um, but, but, you know, um, there's a lot of infused dollars going into trying to shore up um, capacity for, um, for providers to be able to uh, both have those um, uh, services and also, um, you know, to, to support individuals and community uh, to, to um, access those, uh, those services. Does that help? Does that help address your your question? Well, thank you, uh, Amanda. Do we have questions in the chat room as yet? We do not have questions, so you can thank you for asking. You can feel free to ask. Your All right. Name. So one of the other questions we had for you, Ms. Campbell, um, is there an intrinsic disconnect between what is asked of our mental health uh, professionals and what can be delivered? Let me. Um, be more articulate. So when a primary care provider looks for a mental health service, it's often to rectify a behavior. Somebody is perceived as being non-compliant. They're being self-abusive. They may be abusive to someone else, et cetera, et cetera. We want them to behave better, quote unquote. Do we ask appropriate questions? Do we interface with our mental health colleagues efficiently and effectively uh, so that we get those types of uh, needs met most effectively? That's a great question. Um, you know, there's been a movement um, 
to really be both um, on um, the behavioral health side, but I think also um, on, on the physical health side um, for there to be um, person-centered care, right? And that that person-centered care, um, you know, is not a sort of, you know, the, the provider, you know, designing and, and, and you know, um, uh, putting that, you know, plan uh, in place without, you know, a real conversation with uh, the, the patient, right? Um, and, and certainly, you know, um, the bedside manner of, of, of doctors has, you know, has always been sort of built into the culture, right? I think on the behavioral health side, um, you know, because um, the behaviors associated, because of the stigma, right? Uh, around uh, mental health and substance use. And because of the behaviors associated that have generated uh, that stigma, which has, you know, a historical context that, you know, would, would be in of itself, you know, a conversation separate and apart from this. But that stigma uh, and discrimination has permeated public health, right? And the way in which services are delivered, the way in which programs have been historically structured, and the way in which um, individuals needing these services have been somewhat divorced uh, from and, and, and because of the criminalization uh, around, you know, these conditions. Um, I think that there is a much, th this movement that, you know, I talked a little bit about peer, you know, services, and I identify myself as a person in, you know, sustained recovery. The reason and I talk about that is it's a way to personalize and destigmatize um, this condition. And it informs, you know, the policy work that I do, it informs, you know, it's, it's informed my mission, right? Which is to, you know, uh, to, to humanize uh, the way in which individuals uh, with, with substance use um, are, are treated. So the, this work, um, and, and we see this again on the federal level, as well as here in New York State, um, that the infusion of lived experience and the value of lived experience um, uh, ha is really informing uh, both, you know, um, physicians, um, you know, social workers, uh, you know, as well as decision makers on how to be more person-centered in addressing, um, you know, this this uh, public health, uh, these public health issues, and so, um, you know, for example, I had mentioned the crisis stabilization centers that are being created. Those crisis stabilization centers are using a two pronged model to address, um, you know, uh, mental health and acute mental health and substance use uh, issues. Um, it's both the clinical. Um, uh, model, which, you know, th there will be teams of, of doctors, um, there will be, you know, medical assessments done, because as we know, uh, individuals with mental health and substance use often have, you know, uh, uh, comorbid issues that include, you know, um, a, a host of, of, of uh, challenges, um, but also, again, a team of social, you know, uh, clinicians uh, that include, um, you know, licensed um, uh, clinical social workers, case acts, um, but but there's also the um, the peer model that's being embedded into this, the living room model, which some of you may you know know about, which involves um, you know uh, peers to engage individuals and really support um, you know create a more welcoming environment, person centered, uh, and really help to uh, link uh, individuals with uh, with those in community services. So yes, the answer to your question, I think is yes, there is a, a recognition and a value uh, of being person-centered, not just because it's the right thing to do, but because it's, you know, the efficacy of, of, of engaging in, in that kind of conversation that's, you know, that, that provides dignity and respect for the individual who's getting uh, those services. Um, works well for uh, both, you know, uh, the individual 
uh, who's who's in need of care, but also is a is a much better um, you know practice uh, efficacy for the you know for the treatment provider. Thank you. I think we're seeing some chat questions coming through, so I'm going to open it up to Amanda. But I am going to finish by um, putting a little bit of a bug in your ear. Locally, we do have issues with reticence from our mental health uh, professionals in sharing uh, their information with us. Now, some things by law are really confidential, specific psychotherapy notes and so forth, but care plans aren't and uh, treatment plans aren't. And I, as a primary care practice uh, manager and as an insurance company manager, spend a tremendous amount of time chasing down notes from my mental health therapy professionals that could be days, weeks, months old, and so forth. So the bug I wanna put in your ear is to let your mental health therapists know, let your mental health professionals know that it really has to be two-way communication. As we reach out to you, um, we're encouraging you to reach out to us as well, okay? Absolutely. Uh, Amanda, questions? Yes, we have a question that um, is, what are the resources available for patients with dementia and uh, substance abuse? There are limited rehab places accepting those patients. I'm just gonna review that, okay. What are the resources available for patients with dementia and substance use? Um, yes, so um, uh, uh, Sakina, is, is it possible for you to um, share the region that you're in? Uh, hi, uh, hi, sorry, I'm driving. So you may hear some background. Um, so I'm a geriatrician. I work at the NYU Memory Center. And um, so, we have sometimes patients with substance abuse, like alcohol abuse, and uh, they are limited resources in terms of detox places when they have dementia. Um, so that's the first piece of my question. So what are the resources um, out there? So there's a number of, of programs um, uh, that are um, available, but again, given, um, you know, there, there's a there's criteria that would need to to um, you know be um, be looked at. Would it be possible, um, Sakina, for you to um, to connect with me um, offline, and sure. I can work with you to to really sort of you know identify some of the the the, the criteria that you're you're looking okay. at as an individual. Yes, of course. Thank you. Amanda, next question. That is the only question I see in the chat right now. If anybody has another question um, for me, go ahead and unmute if there's something that I missed or feel free to enter it in the chat. Uh, so I have another question and that's a challenge that we, we face as providers uh, is the lack of um, available um, psychiatrists in the community and many do not take insurances. And we, we talk about health disparities and but patients who cannot pay out of pocket or have may only Medicaid, uh, well, they well, cannot, they cannot treat it. So what's, what are we doing and what's the plan for that? Yeah, that's a, that's a issue that comes uh, through you know through Champ uh, when we have individuals who um, uh, you know have certain out of pocket uh, costs associated with getting some of those life saving medications. There are um, ways in which uh, those uh, folks can get um, uh, support. There was a conversation that I just had yesterday um, with one of the. Um, uh, the Cody's out uh, in in a part of the the state that um, you know had some challenges around getting access to um, one of the opioid use disorder medications, and um, what we were able to do a couple of things. One is we were able um, you know uh, to look at um, uh, coupons that are um, available. Uh, sometimes um, the plans have been extremely helpful with that as well, um, you know, in reaching out to, to, to the pharmacy to, to assist. Um, and we can sort of 
uh, work with them on some of those, um, you know, those cases. Um, but one thing I think that's important to know that anything that's on the state formulary, um, you know, a pharmacy can't deny someone access to the medication if they have either fee-for-service Medicaid um, or if they're not uh, able to cover the costs. Um, and that's challenging because um, then it beca then the issue becomes, you know, how do, so are we just waiving these, you know, these costs? And of course, that's, you know, that's not, um, uh, you know, that that's under the law, you know, not, not appropriate, right? So it's, it's so I think what would be helpful if, uh, if, again, if you could uh, reach out to um, our champ team, and they can help facilitate, um, you know, that conversation uh, to see, you know, uh, what we can do for, for your uh, for your patient. Great. A question. Hi. Uh, this is Steve Shamash. I'm an internist. Would it be possible, since there's such a scarcity of psychiatrists, behavioral health workers in general, to set up something in which the general internist could communicate directly, get a consult with a psychiatrist to present their case, get a sense of a cluster of medicines or therapies that might be useful in the absence of being able to turn your patient over to the psychiatrist. Is that something your office could facilitate? So we have facilitated conversations between, um, between docs, um, but it would be, it would have to be a, a, a case by case, um, you know, I would need to know more about the requests. So if you wouldn't, if you would like to reach out to me after this call and we can discuss a little further, um, you know, what, what you're envisioning and then I can sort of help facilitate um, a conversation with the appropriate um, entities for that. Will do. Uh, yeah, I, I would um, augment um, Steve's uh, question and comment. Um, 20 percent of people over the age of 55 has significant mental health issues. There's an explosion of depression and anxiety in the adolescents and in children recently. And with the very complex atypical antipsychotics and the um, multiplicity of very complex antidepressant medications and anxiolytics, psychiatrists really are necessary. It's important we have psychologists, it's important we have uh, licensed social workers and so forth, but we do need psychiatrists. And as um, Dr. Shama said, we don't have enough. Is New York State uh, looking uh, at our numbers and are there uh, any programs uh, designed to get more uh, trained psychiatrists and get them uh, to areas that are geographically underserved? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, and I do know that some of the resources, some of the um, uh, funding that is, is coming through the federal block grants um, is designed to, um, to incentivize um, both through uh, education and training. Um, so, and, and, and also to work to identify, um, you know, areas of the state in which uh, these these services are um, are you know sorely needed. Um, so there are dollars that are being um, infused. There's also I'm wondering uh, whether or not um, you've reached out to the Office of Mental Health to find out. Um, I know that there were a series of conversations that were happening um, that involved. Um, uh, psychiatry, you know, the shortage of, of, of psychiatrists and, and in specifically um, uh, around, um, you know, the long wait lists, you know, uh, that, that folks were um, experiencing, um, you know, uh, you know, in the last two years. Um, I'd be happy um, to, to try to connect you with the right person that could get you on that, um, 
uh, that, that discussion group, because really what needs to happen is that the state needs to understand how um, desperate um, uh, individuals are in certain parts of the state where, you know, these services aren't available. And we know that, you know, in um, particularly in rural parts of the state, um, you know, that network inadequacy <laughs> that exists uh, in particular for, um, you know, for psychiatry, um, you know, and, and, and even, um, you know, for, um, you know, services that, uh, for, for crisis services, right? That's the whole, you know, point of, of starting these new uh, models for, um, for crisis stabilization is, is the recognition that, um, you know, what currently exists is, is, is um, you know, is in need of, of, of infusion. Um, so, so, yeah, so back to um, the initial uh, point, um, you know, I'd be happy to see if I could get you or who, you know, anyone on this call who might be interested in having a conversation with the state uh, to discuss ways in which, um, you know, there's an informed uh, conversation with what's happening on the ground, you know, with providers uh, and, um, you know, and, and so that the state knows, um, you know, and is aware and can move forward with um, strategies to address that. Well, thank you very much. New York NYACP is always uh, interested in engaging with our colleagues of the state to improve healthcare in all forms. Amanda, other questions? Yeah, we've got some questions and comments. Um, first of all, I, I have a comment. Um, if you guys, uh, whoever on the call is interested in that, um, that Stephanie mentioned, um, having a conversation, please email me. I, I put it in the chat uh, earlier. It's a Allen, but I'll put it again. A Allen at nyacp.org. We um, certainly love to um, see how we can assist there. And then um, we do. There, there have been some questions that are so helpful, and there are some requests that um, if the inf if the resource is shared in those conversations, could be emailed to share to everybody, that's great. I can um, facilitate the sharing of that with every, I have everybody's contact information. So um, like Dr. Tall, I know um, you and Stephanie were discussing um, some resources for dementia. So if those are shared, if you can share them with me, I will get them out to everybody so that we can get a, you know resources going across to the group. That would be fantastic. Um, and then there are a couple of questions that came in. One is, do you have any advice for assisting workers, compensation patients with setting up services? Most counselors and psychologists will not accept workers' comp insurance. Yeah, that that is the, um, you know, that, 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 that can be extremely challenging. And, um, you know, again, um, you know, what I would suggest is, um, you know, if, if, uh, those folks are have an EAP program. They can often be um, helpful uh, in providing, uh, you know, uh, you know, in advocating on behalf of. Uh, but also, um, you know, we're happy to uh, help with those cases. Um, you know, so so definitely, um, you know, give us a call and uh, and we'll work to, um, you know, to try to help get uh, get get those folks, um, you know, the services that they need. Great, thank you. And um, we do have another one that asks, um, do mental health records go on your insurance? Uh, and if so, do they affect future life or health insurances, the ability to um, have access to that or qualify? I'm not quite sure what the, what the specifics of that question are. Does the, does the person, um, uh, who asked the question mean, um, is it an issue of confidentiality in which um, that person would, would, would be penalized somehow for? Um... No, so, my, hello, no, hi, Amanda, just Anush. Thanks for taking my question. My camera is not working again. So the question was that, you know, if, if someone is seeking a, a mental health, does that go on their health records and does that impact them getting a life insurance in future or does that uh, um, uh, increase the, the, uh, their um, regular health insurance premiums in future? 
you know, that's a question that um, I am, am not equipped to answer. Um, I do know that um, with any insurance uh, policy, there, there is criteria that's aggregated to determine um, what your rate is going to be, and that includes health conditions. I don't know if there are more stringent um, restrictions um, or, you know, uh, penalties if you have a substance use or mental health condition. Um, but, um, you know, I can certainly um, do a little research for you on that question. And, uh, and uh, if you could, um, you know, get me your uh, email, I'll, I'll um, you know, get that information to you. By the way, I'm, I'm assuming, Amanda, that you will be able to um, put together a list of these questions yeah. and get um, and facilitate some uh, ongoing discussions uh, so that I can, you know, uh, follow up with uh, some of the questions that I've been asked that I may not uh, provide um, complete information on. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, I'll, I'll go through the recording of this and, and uh, get those documented so we can follow up for sure, because I think this is great information as well. Um, I just want to share a few comments that have come out of the discussion. Um, Melanie shared that uh, psychiatric mental health nurse practitioners are going to be filling these needs. And I think she was referring to the rural um, areas and the, the lack of network there. She said there are programs working on this in um, many nurse practitioner schools and rural areas. And uh, Dr. Gomez de Cesare shared that creating an echo type program to improve mental health care in primary care would be fantastic. We have had one for MAT that was very successfully locally. And um, Dr. Gerber agreed um, for the uh, MA, it works for MAT and Hep C. And then um, Dr. Gerber also shared that the VA has a PTSD consultation program through which clinicians and PCPs can call for support, treatment recommendations. Uh, things of that nature. And this is another model in addition to ECHO. Um, and at the VA, um, that uh, the mental health services are available and they have less wait time compared to the community. So if a veteran is in need of mental health service in the community, uh, one can always advise them to look to their closest VA for assistance. So that was some ideas. Those are some ideas. I, I do applaud the concept of the psychiatric nurse practitioner. We employ an excellent psychiatric nurse practitioner who is flat out full running and needs lots of help. And hiring and firing, I mean, hiring and finding others um, is still uh, difficult. And I would remind everybody that there is a collaboration requirement uh, between psychiatric nurse practitioners and psychiatrists and so forth. And with the paucity of psychiatrists, um, our psychiatric nurse practitioners are even finding it difficult to get those collaboration um, agreements in place. So the pipeline is far from full and uh, it's probably going to be quite some time um, before uh, the psychiatric nurse practitioners can actually um, fill uh, what is needed. So we just have um, a few more minutes here. We've got about four more minutes. Um, I do want to just say uh, that I will get together the questions and we'll definitely do some follow up on this. I think this has been a great conversation. It sounds like we want to go a bit further. So I will make sure to do that. Also, just a reminder that I will share the recording to everybody who registered and attended. So if you did miss the first portion or any of the first portion, uh, those will be shared along with the, the presentation slides. So thank you so much, Stephanie, for um, allowing us to do that. And then there is a um, just a, a question about um, if you could comment on the range of legal assistance that is provided. Oh, is this is this to me? Yes, I'm sorry. Yes, it <laughs> <Okay>. is. <laughs> Um, so again, I, I may have mentioned during the presentation, we have a number of um, attorneys um, who do not um, give legal advice, okay? We don't, but, but what we do do is provide uh, legal interpretation of, um, uh, you know, the, 
you know, the contracts, um, help file appeals, um, and provide, you know, um, uh, you know, expertise in terms of conversations that we have with our state partners around around parity issues. So, um, so that's the extent. Um, however, there is um, uh, there are referrals that can be made for individuals who are in need of, let's say, for example, legal action centers. Uh, has attorneys there that often deal with uh, some of the issues. Some of you may be aware of the report that Legal Action Center um, uh, issued um, in conjunction with um, uh, Bloomberg's um, uh, School of Public Health uh, through Johns Hopkins, I believe it was, um, and and all and was looking at um, you know ED protocols for individuals with um, substance use. Um, and, and co-occurring mental health conditions. And as we know, during the, you know, the pandemic, um, many of those, you know, uh, beds in hospital beds have been repurposed for COVID. So really trying to uh, look at, um, you know, standardized protocols for how to address, um, you know, overdose and, um, you know, that, that, that's coming into our um, emergency rooms. Um, so LAC does, uh, you know, has, has a team of lawyers, um, CSS has a, you know, a, a group of health navigators, healthcare navigators, um, that they provide, um, you know, help with those appeals. Um, uh, and, um, and, uh, so I, you know, I hope that's helpful. I think Thank so. you. So Amanda, I think we're at the, uh, witching hour. We are. That went by way faster than I thought it would. And uh, you guys ask great questions. And I think this is going to sounds like it's going to be a great ongoing conversation. So um, thank you so much, Stephanie. Uh, this was really helpful. And, a, and, a, and thank you for all who came and participated. It's great to uh, generate what the needs are and, and see what the next step is. Uh, Dr. Kranz or Dr. Heisig or Dr. Gomez Accessory, did you have any final words? Thanks to all. This was a good conversation and it must continue. This is a problem that's not going to go away and we need to continue to collaborate to fix it as best we can. Absolutely. And, and thank you very much again, uh, Stephanie, for joining us tonight. And, and thank everybody who, who is, uh, who's participated. I, I think I agree. It was a wonderful conversation. And sorry, it's now being interrupted by my dog. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you all for thank the Thank you so much spend this hour with you. Look forward to future conversations.